thought we'd have a look at Kandinsky. We've been oh yeah, oh. my favorite. Oh, we've been tossing Kandinsky around a bit. Yeah, absolutely great. Um, I thought what we'd do, and this will take a few weeks because there's a lot to Kandinsky. Mm. So I'm going to begin talking about Kandinsky tonight, but I think it'll go into next week and maybe even the week after. Good. Because there's a ton. We'll get right into it. And um, I thought we'd just start. This is the um, panel. One of the panels is a that the MoMA has. They have four panels there hanging near the elevator, these four. Which mm. are, yeah, where the, where the Bonnard used to be, right? Yeah, the B Bonnard and the yeah. Picasso. And the Matisse, yeah. And um, so you can sort of see part of this panel, I think, from the, the corridor. But these are the four panels, one, two, three, and four. Oh, wow. They're pretty nice, right? Oh, they're wonderful. Beautiful. It's great. Eyes, they're almost my height. And um, wow. about my height. And these are made in 1914. So, in a sort of a, a, I think, a good place to start thinking about Kandinsky because basically these panels are made sort of just after he completed composition number seven. So, he did 10 compositions, and the first seven were done prior to the, the First World War. And they basically um, sort of, over the course of building seven compositions, and the compositions are his sort of major works. They're the work that he thinks of as basically the, um, the, the summation of all the feelings that have been evolving over time. So they're, they're big grand statements. Earlier on, they're sort of apocalyptic, and he was a bit more sort of um, um, connected to rebelling against the the order of the day economically and politically and everything else. But then they they move into the spiritual, and the, and the sort of the last one definitely takes that leap, and this one definitely takes that leap as well. And so I thought it'd be fun to just look at. Wow, that is so beautiful! My God. At um, let me see if I can get that on the screen. Can you all see that? Yeah, yeah. it's a little yeah. cut off. I'm gonna, if I can uncut that off. Better, better. Yeah. Maybe use the presentation mode. Peter, you can show it on uh, under view and then present. It'll it'll occupy the whole screen. Yeah, yeah. but I don't want to do that, Montserrat. Uh, okay. Because I want to see, I want to be able to jump and move. I think, oh, that's better. Yeah. I turned it on the vertical. To keep it. And also, quite often, people will interject and say, "Can we go back to eight forty-five? I've got something to say about that." And I think it keeps you guys in the conversation, being able to see where we've gone and where we're going, as opposed to just me knowing what that is. You know. Mm -hmm. um, again, feel free to jump in and share your wisdom. But this is the first one. The first panel um, and then I so these are the photos I took um, or cu a couple of them anyway and so these are some of the details so this is this area here so I got a bit obsessed oh wow look at that and a fair Woo! bit of taking detail so um, you got so basically um, you got to remember, Kandinsky was influenced by a lot of things, and I'm going to try and touch upon some of them tonight. But the um, one thing he was doing was he was influenced by Schoenberg and some of the the thinking around contemporary composition, musical composition. Mm. And one of the things that was happening was, was the breaking of the idea of melody and the breaking of the idea of oh, no. a, a consistent theme. And the introduction of ideas of having discordance and differ differing clashing themes that somehow would make sense or evolve, come together as the piece unfolds, the musical piece unfolds. Someone's, someone's got two devices on. 
somewhere. Um, Not me. Okay. Peter, was this the beginning of jazz? I mean, was that an influence like the like that's a really complex question because I was listening to um, the um, fifth, I think it's the 1517 project. Did you listen to that podcast? No. On, it was on um, last year and it was the, um, and now, uh, now I can't remember her name, but it's a African American. Pardon me? 1419. 14, 14, yeah. Ava. Um, Bernie. Bernie. Okay. One episode about music where she does talk about the evolution of jazz and how it came about. And um, I think that it really happened after the war when they changed the tax laws, is what, it, what I recall. And, and I'm testing my memory. <clears throat> yeah, in the 20s, definitely. And, it, and they changed, maybe it was after the First World War, but they changed the laws and said they started taxing establishments based on the the uh, number of singers that they had or something like that. And so basically the owners started saying, you can't have any singers in your group anymore. And so the big band sort of fell apart and, and started introducing, you know, getting the saxophonist to do the solo or the trumpeter had to do a solo. So they found this other way to, to hold the melody and jazz sort of took off, but it's sort of more complex than that, I think, than it, cause it's sort of, comes out of blues and it evolves really from the 19th century. Right. So I can't say it's the beginning of jazz, although um, it's not It's not unrelated, obviously. Um, it looks, if you were to think of jazz and what it might look like, this could be a good solution, right? But one yeah, thing- but I wouldn't. I wouldn't think of Schoenberg and jazz. Oh, me neither, I don't know. No. They seem really different. <laughs> yeah, same tonal. <clears throat> yes. So even though he's moving, so he's moving very freely around and, and he's done many drawings for these paintings and not tonight, but maybe next week or whatever, we'll start looking at some of these drawings to see how he develops his ideas a bit but um he's still thinking of the the um parts as being volumetric so one part he's trying to make it come to life by discovering the form in that area and so there'll be an idea to do with this part here where all these marks are coming together it's very free isn't it like like it's you know, on close inspection, it's very brushy. Not worried too much about sharp edges. There are some, but not many. A lot of painting across the forms. All the things we've been talking about, using temperature to create volume. So, and, but you never get the sense that he's painting that separate to something or this area separate to something. It's sort of coming out of this somehow. It's hard to believe that some of it isn't just accidental. <laughs> well, I think a lot of it's accidental, Sarah. Uh -huh. Like he's, he's moving around. So, you know, with whatever his rhythm is and the color is making form. Uh -huh. And that comes from Goethe. That was one of his influences that, um, you know, color is the higher order than, than drawing in relation to form. Um, and to and to sort of make metaphorical um, color, color that work, color mm. that works metaphorically instead of um, color that's more specific to things in the real world, mm. um, and to come up with associative values for color. So sort of a, a different way of thinking, very romantic, but different way of thinking about color. But at the same time, it works as his, his early paintings, which are you know, lands, the landscapes where he mixes the colors all over the place. He uses the same kind of colors, but it's still representative. Now, now he, he, he takes it a step forward with uh, 
I mean, there's no representation anymore, but the, the, this assemblage of color, color is still there. Yeah, it's in, so it's, I mean, I can, I can see, I can, I can see the, the, the landscape or the, the, the kind of uh, ideal landscape behind that. It's definitely coming out of that, isn't it, Olivier? Yeah. More controlled, though. Like more neutrals, perhaps. Like we look at the these four anyway, you know, there's a lot of neutral areas. Everything's form though, every single part of the painting. Mm. That shape there is working as form. He's thinking about how does this shape, how does this plane, this shape move the cylinder in relation to this? Where is this in relation to that? It's way forward in space. We can see a very clear decision. And the drawing, the overall drawing, the rhythms of the big marks, partly are the thing that pull it together. They move us around and lead us to this and sort of make sense of where this is. Here's some other little areas. Like just chucking the paint on really thick. Lots of impasto. And feeling the form with the brush. He's not just painting shapes in, he's feeling the form with the brush. So he believes he's actually touching something that moves in this way, whatever that might be, or move, here's the plane going this way. So he believes he's touching that thing. Look at the canvas underneath, it's great, right? Almost getting messy like a watercolor. But not quite messy. <laughs> it's alive. If that were not mine, quite messy, no. If that were mine, it would be messy, but it's not messy. I, I love all these details. It's so great. Yeah, I took, I went, it was um a month and a half ago or so. And, um, you know, no one was there. And so I basically had these paintings all to myself and there were no guards coming around so I could get right up close. They're covered in glass though, but mm -hmm. if you get close enough, you can, you don't, you know, there's a little reflection coming in there, I guess. But it's sort of, you feel the energy, don't you? This is consistent, energized. So every mark he's going in there with full belief. Wow. Not, not sort of, you know, going in there half-hearted or, I'll test it out or what I'll just try this out. He's going in there and really going, I'm putting that color on. Look at the shift in temperature there between that cool blue and that warm blue. Beautiful. It does, you know. How much motion in it. Do, it like for sense of size, how how is that like are you would you say those are like quarter inch <laughs> strokes or well, let's see if I can find it. That's it up there. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty small. So that's about a foot. That's about a foot. Wow. Well, these aren't not these aren't big brushes. He's even with his small brushes, he's hit, he's attacking it. And he's how large know, is it, Peter? Sorry. What's that? How large is it? The, this this. Detail, in real life, yes. Mm -hmm. About a foot tall. Uh, okay. My estimate. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Wow. And you can tell he's very aware or very alert to and, and very um, cognizant of what the colors are doing as he's putting it on because some areas remain very, very lightly painted. And just touched even, you know, here it gets a little bit impasto-y. So he's had to have a few bits of energy come in there, different types of marks and stuff. Here, he, look at this. He's saying that's a plane that turns. That's a cylinder that turns. Mm. So he's going the marks across the form. Creates volume. So here's one of the other panels. panels. And then some details. Like it's beautiful. Right. God. 
So simple ideas like the warm and cool that we talk about. But the moving in, in one into the other, constant moving, like even this is a painting, right? Yes. And that's just there, that little bit there. Right. Here we go all the way back in space. So he has this big form, what it's like a big spoon upside down. You know, the, we're looking at the bottom of the spoon. And um, it goes all the way in, all the way in, all the way in through here, all the way back in space. And then it comes out again. Back out. Okay. You know, it says sometimes he's picking up paint, grabbing it off his off his palette and just chucking it on and squishing it a bit. But even here, you've got the, the blue merging into that yellow. It's beautiful. The color is unbelievable. Isn't it? Yeah. Where was that spot? It's maybe down here. So much black. In this one, yeah. yeah that's you don't get the sense there's a lot of editing. Like he, he knew what he was doing. Well, you know, that's a good question. I think the editing was happening, was happening, but happening as he was going. So sort of like when you're driving in Manhattan and you, and you, you know, you're to be a good driver in Manhattan, you can't obey the rules. So when I first started driving in Manhattan, you know, I, I was trying to stay in lane and stop at the lights and slow down and speak, you know, do all the things you meant to do. And you get nowhere very fast and everyone gets angry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not defensive driving, it's aggressive driving. It's sort of, you gotta find, you gotta, you gotta connect to the rhythms of the, of the, of the flow. Mm -hmm. Right. And looking ahead and be look, always aware that something's something next to me and, mm -hmm. You might have to change things quickly and you need to know that it's where the space is and looking ahead to see what's happening up above so you change lanes well in advance so you're always moving like the, the taxi drivers are just in the flow and it's like that it's like the constant editing is happening as you're moving flowing shifting um, instead of thinking of it as errors now, if the taxi driver was taking the driving test, they'd fail because they're making errors, if you think of it in that way. Right. Because they're, they're not driving in the way that one has to drive to get, a, get their license. And that's the way people teach at school. You know, at art schools, they teach as if you're like a learner driver. We're not interested in that. No. I'm more interested in Kandinsky tonight. Yes. Can we, can we talk about <laughs> the, that's so great. the edges a little? What's that? What's that? Can we talk about the edges? Yeah. Because he, he, a lot of his stuff just floats in the middle. He has a weird relationship. I was curious what you think mm. of his relationship to the edges on each of these pieces. So the edges of the rectangle. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, definitely, where are we at here? We are at number. 857. So definitely all four of these are let's let's not so much that engage the edges more in. Yes, yes. Yeah, this, one, this one, one, yes. That's different. This one less so, but still there. And this one less so as well. So basically mm -hmm. it's you it's almost, I think it, in this period, almost a little bit like I think of Caravaggio. Hmm. So you mean? there's the, these movements of these larger volumetric forms all moving in relation to each other. Act, and the it's the act, it's the movement of one against the other that's contributing to the a lot of the expression. So it's not just the parts like the crazy stuff that's going on there versus there versus here versus here. These are almost like different ideas, but somehow it's the movement of it's how, somehow how these little parts become part of bigger areas and those bigger areas move in relation to each other. Um, that contributes a great deal to, to the expressive power of what's going on. 
And once you start thinking in and out, once you start moving one part in relation to another part, it's almost going to become nonsensical if we were to sort of crop the canvas here and have all this action right up against the edge. So he's, he's got to sort of make sense of it somehow. And to do that, he's qu having these quieting down areas. Now then, he's still engaging the edges because he's turning this into form. So he's still thinking warm and cool and how does this plane move to set this up? Because this is like the front of a boat maybe. So he's sort of, he's aware of the way this is working in relation to that edge. And when we look at this edge, you know, when I look at this edge now, that does feel like it's a form and it's back in space. Like I start to get a sense of the picture plane. Mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like it's, it's pushing up against the picture plane. It feels like it's back from the picture plane. So this is all doing its work here. Like there's nothing breaking the picture plane. Everything feels like it's going back from this imaginary film that we think is but that we sense is somewhere there. And the same with all these. With all these. So it's not like a Franz Klein, Michael, which you know, the whole way his work is by very forcefully engaging the edges mm -hmm. and with this very powerful ge geometry across the surface of the big shapes are enacted against each other in relation to each other. It's not like a de Kooning who would also engage the edges in a, this is much more lyrical, um, slower, um, intentionally, I think. And it's partly because of the way of what he's trying to do. So, you know, the, um, he was influenced by the, the Russian avant-garde, but also just the thinking at the time, which was Re rebelling or responding to the materialism of the of the of the 19th century and so you know there was all this thinking going down um to do with to do with um getting the soul back into their work into the arts into into their world um and so the the um and the slowness that he's achieving by that so he's allowing these forms to sort of slowly move back in space these are not i mean they seem like there's a lot of movement but in reality they're sort of slow paintings i think hmm. you know, is this I, one in this in the same corridor what's that is this the one you have up now is yeah. that in that same corridor the same elevator corridor okay yeah Yeah, these are the four. Yeah. Here's another little detail. So he's clearly got in mind what he wants when he puts down the color and you suddenly realize that's going to be this. He's very quick to make it. He doesn't muck around. Look at this mark, how it dances around him. Beautiful. That red is so, so beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting what you're saying about how the individual smaller smaller areas really then all add up into into larger areas yeah so that was a you know that was a big deal like the thinking at the time so this was done in 1914 but if you go back a little bit before that everyone was had to make a painting that sort of worked as a whole had that they were they were after achieving a unity that worked as a whole and so Kandinsky sort of threw out a lot of that thinking, but he had to achieve it another way. And so he allowed the parts to become something, idea, almost ideas of their own, but not unrelated to the other parts in these paintings, because these are 
remember these are compositions that were that were developed through a lot of drawing so a lot of like um almost unconscious drawing just free roaming drawing where he would develop his ideas and sometimes some days certain things would come into a drawing and the next day you know he'd keep a few of those things because they seemed to work and he'd discard the others and so it evolved over time um that beautiful area there wow but he was you know he was the big push was to get the spiritual back into art so he began with basically the the russian myths so bringing in knights and trying to basically illustrate the stories and you can see this is very romantic this painting even the way it was painted yeah You know, laid, that is so beautiful. My goodness. That romantic sensibility. Wow. Wow. So this is all him. I've never seen oh. the early, these things. This is all Kandinsky. Wow. Yeah, wow. Well, earlier. So I thought we'd start off with that one, which is sort of, an, I think, a nice one to begin with because we sort of see how he developed his ideas and where he got to to a certain point, because I think we, we will go beyond that as well, but just for the point of tonight, it's important to, just to see what he was thinking about and how these ideas came in. And so, you know, the, the Russian myth and the romanticism, um, so, and the, and the looking at the common folk, the peasant almost, um, you know, and getting, you know, these are called, wow. Like that. That's just adorable. <laughs> like that one? Oh God, yes. <laughs> Cry. Yes, yeah, so Peter. That, that that's what I was referring to. If you if, if you look at the the, the the right part of it, it's very very much like like you know, the, the the one you discussed before. Yeah, the, I mean, the very abstract so, ones. Olivia, this, and this is so he called these impressions. So he had three types of paintings, impressions. This, and this is sort of after he got past the early stuff where he was. So basically to get the spiritual into his work, he began literally. He thought, I'm going to put in, I'm going to paint this myth that has spiritual connotations within itself. So, he, but that's, a, that's literal. So he's not really getting the spiritual into his work. Yeah. And he's trying to channel the romantic spirit. Um, to, and to, and to sort of paint motifs that are that are more down to earth, and he, he was very obsessed with folk art, and the idea, you know, and in, in sort of visiting, um, looking at folk art and, and visiting um, peasants who had you know filled their houses with um, folk art. The thing that really struck him was that when he walked into their house every single surface, everything was covered in art. So basically the walls were painted beautifully, the, you know, painted by hand, but basically decorated by the owner. Wow. And, and he felt that he was surrounded by the, the, the expressive force, the, the, the power of the expression. So that became a thing. How do I surround the viewer with all this color, all this intensity? But and then the what, what year would that be? This is like uh, 19, oh, I'll tell you, this is 1903. This is Gabriel Munter, his girlfriend at the time painting. And then the Fauves happened. So he was very influenced by the thinking of the Fauves. And of course he's Russian oh. and uh, unique at this time. So he was basically painting you know, again, influenced by, there were a bunch of Russians at the time living in Munich or just out of Munich. That and looks that, very much uh, like uh, Goncharova, Natalia Goncharova. Okay. I think. A very different sensibility than the Fauves, right? Mm. But trying to, you know, the Fauves basically were in intensifying all the color to its maximum, basically. Yeah. So he's trying this is softer. But, but you'll notice very little neutral, 
all intense colors and having to come to some sort of, you know, that dark we could say would be neutral, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit up here, but even here when he's trying to be neutral, it doesn't quite be neutral. But even in the negative space there, he's making a cylinder out of that negative space. Amazing. So he's still thinking the what we saw in, the, in those uh, four panels at the moment, he's still doing, he's doing here very early on with these negative shapes. The right part is really abstracted. It looks ab abstracted, unless so, we look for the roof. Or, but uh, as a together, it looks like an abstract shape coming out of the tree. So. And so the way he thought about it, these impressions, these are just one-off paintings that he made. And, and, then, and then basically, the idea is that he's responding to external stimuli, so nature, but he's trying to find a resonance, an internal resonance with that. So he's trying to find something that resonates inside of himself with what's happening externally. And so he called these impressions and he made a bunch. And they're sort of like a little bit like Kirshner, if you think of his paintings as well. That sort of crazy intense color. And then he made things that are sort of, this is still an impression, but he made other paintings which were basically he called improvisations. And they are, they are basically like, as the word says, improvised paintings. But what he's trying to do is make um, some, some painting from, and, and the, the impression he gets of some internal sensibility that he's getting or internal feeling he's getting or internal nature. So he sort of, separated the idea between external nature and internal nature. And he did, you know, there's quite a lot of drawing surviving. So the drawing skirt, these are sort of three Cossacks. And so the motive, that motive appears a bit, but there's sort of, this is an interesting little painting because the, um, we start to get some of the themes coming in, like some of the sort of the um, um, ideas coming in. So he's got the three Cossacks coming in here as an idea. Um, this is called improvisation number 27. But then he has this sort of, um, you know, some boats with oars down here. And then he has a little, a little, um, a fight happening here between some some um, cavalry men on horses. I mean, he has a hill and a bridge, so he has a, a castle up here. So he has these different sort of, you know, very loosely drawn. But if you look at the drawings, you'll see how he got to these shapes. Um, and they're coming together to form this Peter. Yeah. Can we can you go back to eight six seven and look at that? And what painting is is that? There it is. That's really neat. What what's the name of that painting? This is called Murnau Mountain. No. Pardon. Oh, sorry, this is called, I'm just going to read out the title. I'm just going to read my handwriting here. Um, this is called Munich um, Schwabin with the Church of St. Ursula. Oh, okay. Munich. Munich? Yeah. Okay. St. Ursula. Okay. Church of St. Ursula. That's a really, in, there's a, it's just, that's a wonderful painting. It really, yeah. You like this one, yeah? Yes, I do. What do you like about this, George? Well, I like the, um, you go from the, the broad foreground in, into the, the, the background, the buildings, the church, but 
it's just this wonderful progression back and it, it just flows so well. And the colors are great. They just, they're all, they all work, work together and work off of each other and with each other. It's a and yet it easy. remains soft. It remains, it's, it's not even with those bright colors, there's a softness to it. Right, yeah. Isn't like it? It's it's beautiful. Big, the edges are like, it's almost like the minute I looked at this, I just saw circles, like just a bunch of circles everywhere. So I feel like, I don't know what his technique was with the brush, but it just felt like the circles of the field go along with the circles of the heads of the people. Just, mm. it's really interesting. Wow. And the, the worms and the coals, what he does with them, it just, yeah, just it's perfect. a good one. Yeah. And very interesting dialogue between the like the way he moves the reds around mm -hmm. and the way he moves the greens around. Yeah. Right. All all you know finds a way to get the greens up to here. And then the sort of the counter argument, like the, the little rectangular red that he that sort of all of this culminates in. Right. And then the way he answers finds a similar idea with the green over there. Mm-hmm. And the variations of the green, like he's never really, you know, he's always shifting the color, shifting the color. The cools, the warms, what they're doing, how the planes are working. Right. Alive, isn't it? Oh, it really it's, is, yeah. Strange with the intense blue. Mm. Would have, it would have been too easy with the red and the green, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. His use of black in this is really, really nice. Um, just it moves you around the canvas as well, and it really keeps the yellow in check. Right. Mm -hmm. There's some blue in that black too. Yeah, really nice. Is there some? There's an artist named is it Otto Blumeyer or something like that, um, who does a lot with the red and the green, the complementary colors that are really striking like this. Is it Otto Blumeyer or does that ring a bell? Um, you know, if Otto Blumer. There's, there's a whole bunch. There are a whole bunch of people painting in Munich at the time who were thinking like this. But Franz Mark, I think of as this blue and yellow for some reason. I'm thinking and green. Um, that cow, the painting of the cow mm. from the that the Guggenheim has. They never put it up because it's too figurative. But uh. they have this awesome Franz Mark painting of this cow, which is sort of these colors. It is such a stark contrast of uh, the city or the factory and this field, like the proximity, right. and the difference. It's amazing. Like that cloud, it's, is it smoke or a cloud, right? I think that's smoke actually. Yeah, I mean it is, but it's in where a cloud might be. Yeah. It's a very bizarre shape, isn't it? Yes. It's, you know, it's sort of necessary to make the whole to get the rhythm of this whole thing moving around. Jesus. This great big structure. Very interesting structure. It's perfect. Thanks, George. For making me go back to that. Look at that pink though. Look at that little pink. <gasps> yeah, it's really wonderful with the green. Completes that triangle there, that, that idea. That triangle, and then it comes around and does that. And then he's got another triangle next to this. Can you hear my cat? Is that your cat? You're going crazy. Yes, yeah, someone's cat is so <laughs> It was pissed. a good soundtrack. Good soundtrack. I'm in big trouble when I get out of, uh, out of this room. my cat go crazy. <laughs> this is another improvisation. Oh, that's great. Woo. So these are sort of one hit. I love that. That's really trying to connect to an inner feeling and then make it so in the same way he's doing here which is a, this you know making a um an impression so he's trying to trying to come up with a a in sort of a um an inner reverberation or 
um, with or coming to some sort of vibratory accord with an external source. With these, he's trying to do it with an internal source. You know, he's influenced by Schopenhauer, who was basically saying, arguing that the will is much more important than representation. And so the, what that meant was that artists were starting to think, you know, the will, the will of the artist is, is the thing that creates the form that, that allows the spiritual to come in. And remember, we were talking about this recently, that film by Augustin, mm. where he had his own painting and this painting that he made, which was successful. And, but he decided to repaint it and paint it over again because he felt he hadn't had the experience with that painting that gave him the sense that he discovered meaning in the form. So he made a nice painting, but it wasn't meaningful to him yet. And I feel that that's when the spiritual comes in, when we find that meaning. But for that meaning to come in, like in any relationship, we have to fight for it. We have to sort of find a way to fight for it. Mm. Interesting. Like Harry Houdini, you know, who made up all these escape tricks and each one that he did had to get more and more complex. So he kept trying to find a way to make it more and more difficult for himself so he could find a new way. He had to test himself and find meaning in that moment so he could find a new way to escape. A new and more difficult way. And as a painter, I feel like we've got the same job. We have to continually find a way. And this is the this is the difficulty. What right? we th we think of painting as being this thing that we just do, and it's sort of linear. But it's not linear. It's more circular. And part of that circle is that we have to find a way to get ourselves into trouble. And then then by creating that problem, and that's the problem that, and not trouble because. It's got to be the right sort of trouble, the trouble that's going to give us the opportunity to do the thing that we know that's when we're at our best. That's when we're sort of, that's where my, I'm really flying now. I'm really um, have a chance to do, to, to, to show what I can really do. It could be I, my tonal abilities or color abilities or line abilities or whatever it might be. My ability to evoke light or space. And, you know, that's what Gustin was doing by destroying, you know, by not stopping when he had a good painting, but actually to continually work with it until he, f until he had pushed himself in a corner and then found the, the answer. This is another improvisation. Mm. This is called improvisation number 27. And so the drawing is key because it's the drawing that moves him around. And as he's doing more and more and more of these drawings, he starts to develop motifs that he seems to return to time and time again. And so tonight I'm just really looking at the, you know, the two, um, the expressions and the improvisations, those two types of paintings. So the impressions and the, and the improvisations. Mm -hmm. I might get into the compositions, I think. Developing these, these ideas more fully. Oh, and so no. there's like, still at this stage, you know, this is um, improvisation number 21, this is 1911, this is done. But still at this stage, there's the, the figuration and a lot of the ideas that are coming in from the myth, from the Russian myths, the channeling of the of the um, the uh, the primitive ideas. <laughs> when we behave, come on. Sorry, that's okay. You know, the folk art ideas. 
That's interesting. I could see that actually in that painting. And yeah. Six, uh, almost six fifty-five, Peter. Okay. Thanks, Katja. We'll just finish up with these three then. So the you know the these big drawing marks are coming out of his drawings, which are very free and easy and moving around, which is I think very important for us to do. Find a way where we can sort of connect easily to the to the things that we're thinking about. Did a kitten? Um, he's now a cat. <laughs> Sounds incredible. That is. Huge from 1914. Wow. And then this one's called Impression. And there's another impression um, done in 1911. Concert. It's called Concert Impression. And here's those. Um, the Cossacks coming in again, appearing in <laughs> context. These big shapes, big areas, just color patches almost. Very clear though, right? Beautiful. Beautiful. Wow. Yeah. 